The nation of Iran, I know it's you know, July 4th weekend and I start my sermon by talking about Iran. But the nation of Iran is much in the news these days as we learn that it is one of the leading nations supporting terrorism around the world and of course it has nuclear aspirations. What I'm trying to say about this is that this is not new news. Some of you younger individuals may be saying, wow, Iran, who are these people? But we've, we've been hearing about this nation for a long time. Back in the 1980s, Iran was already America's sworn enemy and denounced the West's politics and society every time it had a chance, called us the American devils. And it was during this stormy time back in the 80s that a group of students and political extremists invaded the American embassy in Tehran and took 52, 52 Americans as hostages. Interesting side note, one of the student leaders of that rebellion, if you wish, of that movement was the former president of Iran, Mahatmud Ahmadinejad. Back in the 80s, uh, we were in Canada in those days, and I remember a story about Ken Taylor. I don't know if you've heard of Ken Taylor. Ken Taylor, he was the Canadian ambassador in Tehran, who became a national hero, both in Canada and even here in the United States, because uh, during that hostage crisis, that lasted 444 days. You know, we have sometimes one person, one soldier held for a month or two months. Imagine 52 Americans from the embassy held hostage 444 days. And during this hostage taking, Ken Taylor, the Canadian ambassador, managed to smuggle six American diplomats out through the Canadian embassy, risking not only his life, but the lives of his family and his staff as well. If you remember, there was a movie in 2012 that came out with Ben Affleck called Argo, and it, was, it told that particular story. Well, after the crisis was over, Ken Taylor was interviewed about his role in this affair, and he was asked how he felt during this dangerous time. And he said that for him, it was the diplomatic moment of truth where all of his training and preparation were tested in one critical moment. You know, a lot, of, a lot of different professions train for precisely this moment. Public security and military people are trained in advance to react in a very specific way at crucial moments. Uh, medical professionals have to make split second decisions that may save lives. Athletes train for years in preparation for one event, lasting sometimes only seconds, striving to peak in athletic excellence precisely at one particular point in their careers. Now I say all of this because I think that there is a parallel here with our own experience as Christians and these moments of truth that I have just described. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we also come to a time in our spiritual lives where everything we know and everything we have practiced is put to the test in a single, in a single moment. And I think it's helpful if we understand this ahead of time before that moment of truth actually comes upon us. In order to gain insight and better prepare us for this experience, I'd like to look at an event in the life of Abraham and review how this great man of faith reacted when he had to face his own moment of truth. Now before we look at the incident itself, let's, let's look at some background information in order to familiarize ourselves with Abraham and his life. It begins in Genesis 11. We know that Abraham was chosen by God to be the father of a great nation through whom the Messiah would eventually come. He was called to come out of his home in Ur, which is present day Iraq, and settle in the land of Canaan, which is present day Israel. And God promised him a son to begin the great nation in the future. And so after many, many years, when his wife continued to be barren, after the promise was made that he would have a son, he and his wife agreed that he would produce a child with his wife's servant, Hagar. 
And eventually we read that God did bless him with the promised child through Sarah, his own wife, long after uh, both of them were beyond child, uh, child uh, you know, uh, rearing years. He was 100, she was 90, they had, they had their first child. With time, even though he did not own any of the land where he lived, he nevertheless became wealthy and comfortable in advanced age. Wealthy, comfortable, he had his son, he had his wife. All was good. One day, however, everything he had learned about God in a lifetime was put to the test in a single moment, a single decision where God asked him to sacrifice his own son. And so in Genesis 22, we see Abraham's moment of truth, but we see his moment of truth come in stages. Stage number one, God gives him a test. So let's go back to Genesis 22, shall we? And let's read verse one and two. Here's the test. It says, now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And he said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. Now you need to understand a test is not a temptation in this case. A temptation is the attempt to seduce one into evil. God does not do that. He does not try to seduce us into doing something evil. The devil does that, but God doesn't. A test is an exam, okay? It's often without warning. You know, it's as if God will hold us up to the light and He will examine us, either through, through trial or challenge, even give us a blessing. Some people think that blessings are not trials, but for some people, having great blessings sometimes bring trials. And so God, when He tests us, He allows us to experience something with the purpose of examining our reaction. So God's test for Abraham is that he, he tells him to offer up his son as a sacrifice. Now, we know that in later times, the very thought of this would have contradicted God's established and revealed law. You know, you, you can't do that, that would be wrong. But during this particular period in history, like Hagar's role you know, in producing children, the sacrificing of children was within the religious culture of the people where Abraham lived. And although difficult, it wasn't something that was unheard of. People did that. And so the test facing Abraham was not a moral one, but rather an emotional and a spiritual one. Giving up a child that he loved. Giving up the child that represented all of his hopes for the future nation that was to come from him. God said, from you there'll be a great nation that's going to come. And then many years later he says, okay, now I want you to sacrifice that child. Oh, wait a minute, Lord, how, how's that going to happen? Stage two, Abraham responds to God's test. Let's continue reading verse three. He says, so Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took his two young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Abraham said to his young man, stay here with the donkey and I and the lad will go over there and we will worship and return to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, my father, and he said, here I am, my son. And he said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Note that nothing is mentioned here about the night that Abraham spent before leaving with his son in the morning. Could you imagine such a night? Have you ever been up with a sick child? Can you imagine the night before you leave to go sacrifice your only son? Can you imagine the agony, the praying, the struggle? 
I can almost hear his prayer now, Lord, please, anything but this, anything but my beloved son. Have you never had a prayer like that? Oh God, not that. Oh Lord, please tell me this is not what you want me to do. I mean, it's staring you right in the face, but you're saying, oh no, not that. You know, when we utter prayers like this, we know that our moment of truth has come. Note also that by the morning the decision is made, God's will will be done and Abraham leaves with Isaac. You don't read any murmuring or complaint, any indication of his feelings. In other words, Abraham responds with obedience and obedience is always the correct response to a test given to us by God. The great question here is why? Why did he go ahead and do it? After all, Isaac represented everything that God had promised and now all of that seemed in contradiction. You know, during that time, the fact that you would have children and many, many descendants, that was the closest idea that you could come to of, of, of living beyond death, that you somehow would live on through your children. And to lose your only son was not only losing your only son in this life, but somehow was short-circuiting any existence that you might have in the future beyond death as well. Now the answer to this question in Genesis is not answered in Genesis, but rather is answered in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 17 to 19. So stay in Genesis, let me read for you Hebrews chapter 11, where the writer answers the very question, why did Abraham do this? Verse 17, he says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom it was said, in Isaac your descendants shall be called. So the writer here is making reference to the fact that, yeah, this was the son, this was the one that all the hopes and dreams were pinned on. This is the one that Isaac was about to offer up a sacrifice. And then he says in verse 19, he, meaning Abraham, he considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. And so the Hebrew writer says that Abraham offered his son, was willing to do it because he sincerely believed that God could raise Isaac back from the dead, that he could spare him somehow. Somehow God is going to make this thing right, somehow. Even if it means bringing Isaac back from the dead. After all, he reasoned that if God could produce life from two dead bodies, like he and his wife had when they produced Isaac, if God could do that, then he could also bring Isaac back from the dead as well. Abraham didn't know how, but he clung to the promise that God would give him descendants somehow. And brothers and sisters, this is the reasoning of faith. That's how faith reasons. Abraham believed in God's promises and he also believed in God's power. He had seen the power in the birth of Isaac and he continued to trust that God's power would guarantee the promise concerning Isaac as well, no matter what, no matter what. This is what faith is all about. It's about trusting that God will fulfill His promises even when we have no idea how He's going to do that. Because you know what? We want the instructions, we want the details, don't we? Well, how are you going to do that? How, how, how did you create the world from things that are unseen? Tell us, you know, how is A connected to B and B connected? Give us the equation, give us the science, give it to us. We want to know how stuff is done. Uh, no. Obeying God and trusting that He can and will work things out, that's, that's the reasoning of faith. Abraham believed that God's power could overcome even death in order to keep His promise. 
This is the same faith that we have in Christ. You know, you're saying, wow, that's pretty amazing. You know, Abraham had faith like that. Boy, I'm glad God's not asking me to have faith like that. Really? Well, he's asking you to believe that he's going to resurrect you from the dead. Isn't that why you're here today? Did you just come here because you had nothing to do on the July 4th weekend? Or did you come here eschewing perhaps other activities because you actually believe that God is going to raise you and I from the dead? How is He going to do that? I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm going to be cremated. How's He going to take that, 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 you know, that bucket of ashes? How, how's He going to bring all that? I don't know. I have no idea. He hasn't revealed that to me. What He's revealed to me is that He can do it. He can do it. He did it through Jesus Christ. I see His resurrection. If He can resurrect Jesus, well, He can, he can resurrect Mike too. Stage number three, Abraham follows through. He obeys. Go back to Genesis 22. Verse nine, it says, Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. You know, when God promised Abraham and Sarah a son and the promise was not immediately fulfilled, they tried to work it out themselves and they created a bigger problem, right? I mean, there was jealousy and conflict between Hagar and Ishmael, the servant and the other son. There was conflict between them and Sarah and Isaac, the heir of the promise, and his mother. But this time, Abraham does exactly what God tells him to do. The substance of faith is believing that God can and will keep His promises and responding to Him in faithful obedience because of this. Abraham demonstrates a fully mature faith in his complete obedience based on his trust in God's word. That's mature faith. This is the goal of our spiritual training and practice. To take God at His word and be prepared to live or die by it. You know, God doesn't ask us to offer our children to demonstrate our faith. I'm glad of that. However, if our faith was strong enough, we could do it if He asked us to. And then stage four, God works it out. Chapter 22, beginning in verse 11, He says, But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket and by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it will be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and he said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, indeed, I will greatly bless you and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men and they arose and went together to Beersheba and Abraham lived at Beersheba. Stage four, God works it out. Abraham's faith is complete because his obedience is complete. His son and his future hope were on the line because of his trust in God. Notice that Abraham offers his worship and praise only after he has offered his obedience. Abraham, the father of our faith, teaches us that worship is only acceptable when offered from those whose faith is demonstrated in trusting obedience. Don't get me wrong, Abraham wasn't perfect, he sinned like all of us. 
But Abraham's faith grew to a point that when he came to the moment of truth in his life, he was able to trust God with his most precious possession, and that was his only son. You know, Mount Moriah is the place where Abraham went with Isaac to face a severe test. It's also the place where the Jewish temple was later built. Did you know that? Mount Moriah. Today, the Muslims have a mosque on that spot where the temple was. Now there's a mosque there. And I've been to that mosque inside. When you go inside, you have to take off your shoes. You go inside and you know, there are carpets everywhere and there are Muslims praying and you know, milling about. But there's a fence on the inside and the fence surrounds a huge rock where they say this was the place where Abraham was going to offer Isaac. The Muslims, they believe that this is the place, the rock, this is the place where uh, Muhammad uh, went up to heaven uh, riding on a winged horse. That's their, uh, that's their uh, belief. This is the Mount Moriah, if you're wondering geographically where he went. Abraham's experience at Mount Moriah is one that each of us as Christians, we can relate to as well. You see, in each of our lives, there is a Mount Moriah. There is a place where we encounter our own moment of truth. It's a place where God seems to stretch the limits of our faith almost to the breaking point. For example, He'll ask us what seems impossible for us to do or he'll lead us to the edge of our worst fear, or he'll call on us to step out beyond our understanding, beyond our strength. And it is here where we find the faith that counts as righteousness. It is here where the faith that raises the dead is expressed. It is here where we meet the living Christ and find him dwelling within our faith. And so after hearing this particular lesson, what's the obvious question? Well, the obvious question is this. Have you reached your Mount Moriah yet? Have you been there? Let me tell you this. Don't worry, you will one day. Every one of Jesus' disciples gets the call to go there one time at least in their life. One time at least in your life, you also will be at Mount Moriah. It may be a temptation that we have to overcome no matter what. It may be a situation that seems impossible. It may be someone or something we truly love that we have to let go. It may be a challenge that won't let us go and won't let us rest in peace until we accept it. Regardless of the situation, we all eventually arrive at Mount Moriah one day. And if we, like Abraham, trust completely in God's power and His promises, we too will experience the joy of God providing for us at that critical moment. You see, if the Lord decides to test you, He does so with the knowledge that He can provide for you as well. So here's my final point, and the lesson is yours. If you've been to Mount Moriah and seen the Lord provide for you, let this be the substance of your joy and witness. And when you are discouraged, remember how God provided in the past because He will again in the future. And if you are there for the very first time at this moment in your life, then I encourage you, do what God says, no matter what being assured that He has the power to keep His promises to you. So bringing it down even to a more personal level, so where are you this morning? Is this the day that you'll believe in Jesus Christ? You know, sometimes we don't believe simply because we don't want to believe or we don't want to do what God wants believers to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not because the believing part is too hard, it's because the believer's life seems too hard. Yeah. 
I ask again, where are you this morning? Is this the day you go from believing to obeying? Is this the day that you obey your conscience and you restore it to the Lord in prayer? Is this the day you obey the call of our leaders to begin serving, to begin giving, to begin attending? Wherever you're at, please come as we stand and sing. Remember that God provides for all of our needs at Mount Moriah. Shall we sing the song of encouragement?